to um don <laughs> Thank you. So welcome once again, everyone, to those who are viewing this webinar that has been recorded. We are gathered here on uh, Tuesday afternoon, January the 17th, a number of us looking at the question of what, where to start in becoming an affirming ministry. So welcome. Tony. I'm going to spend a few minutes with you just talking a little bit about why is it important to consider becoming an affirming ministry? Uh, and the question that we often hear is, well, we're already welcoming, so why become affirming? Um, and I'm going to extract some of the information that contain, is contained within a document currently uh, on the Affirm United website. Uh, and so some ministries currently and already include some signs of inclusion, and they may feel that they include everyone and wonder why would need to specifically mention sexual orientation and gender identity. And when the question of becoming an affirming ministry arises, people may feel that they're already welcoming, so there's no reason to become. It's offering more than a welcome. Being an affirming ministry, it's not merely about welcoming people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, words like welcoming and inclusion suggest those on the inside have the power uh, to choose and accept those who are on the outside. And this makes it sound like an act of charity to welcome those who are different or marginalized. Affirming ministries acknowledge that God's love is wider and more encompassing than they can imagine, let alone live out. And they commit themselves to sharing that news with others who may have heard quite a different message. Because voices of condemnation, exclusion, and hatred are loud and persistent within the church and in society, affirming ministries make a public statement about who they are and what they believe. They understand that while it might be risky and challenging to come out, because yes, for affirming ministries, and those faith communities, it is a coming out as an affirming ministry, but it's often far less dangerous than it is for the 2S LGBTQIA plus people themselves. Affirming ministries believe it is important to be a public witness and to be a role model for other ministries. In becoming an affirming ministry, it's declaring that all gender identities and sexual orientations are a gift from God. Most marginalized people spend their lives surrounded by messages of hatred, judgment, negativity about themselves and their relationships. And that is cer certainly true uh, for myself, uh, identifying as a gay man, and knowing from a very young, young age, probably seven or eight, uh, that I was different. Uh, I didn't necessarily think and act the same way as other little boys did. And some of us have grown up with a terrifying and unnameable sense of otherness and punctuated now and again by words such as queer, fag, fruit, deviance, and the list can go on. And that certainly was my experience. I can remember in elementary school and on the school playground uh, times, not only did I recognize, recognize myself as being different, unfortunately, so did some of the other boys and bullies 
uh, who decided that I was an easy target. Uh, many of the aforementioned people received strong messages of condemnation for their, from their loved ones, coworkers, friends, and faith communities. Such hateful words and practices are sp spoken in the name of Christianity and many 2S LGBTQIA plus people hear only that side of the story. They think that all Christians think that way. In fact, it's difficult for those of us who that has been our experience in, in growing up um, that an actual faith community or a church can be uh, a safe place. They may believe that God does reject them, that Christians who value inclusion and justice for people of diverse genders and sexualities need to speak up about love and compassion. We cannot assume that newcomers or people in our communities will know what we believe unless we tell them. So we have to be explicit. Affirming ministries commit themselves to proclaiming and following Jesus' way of love and compassion, not a way of judgment and condemnation. They will make a statement of vision and hope part of their mission statement. As an affirming ministry, it's creating a safe space. Affirming ministries acknowledge the hurt and the pain that has been part of the church experience for many people because of their identity or sexuality. The bitterness of the debate within the church about same gender, trans, and related rights left many people distrustful of the church. I can recall back in the years surrounding the decision of 1988, and at that time being part of a United Church congregation uh, who would be considered more on the very fundamental conservative end of the spectrum uh, and sitting on the board of session uh, and the discussions that took place around the question of uh, ordination of LGBTQ individuals, uh, as well as membership. Recognizing myself, but at that time, certainly not being out, uh, having to, and I hate to even use the words, but suffer in silence. Uh, not being able to speak my truth uh, in those sessions, but simply to sit back, listen, and take it. Some individual communities of faith in the United Church have taken a position against gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans people, declaring that they will never have a gay minister, that they condemn homosexual relationships, or that they will never celebrate equal marriages. Some LGBTQIA 2S plus people have been asked to resign as Sunday school teachers or youth leaders, or have been made unwelcome in their communities of faith. Sadly, that was also my experience in the congregation that I just spoke of. Uh, in 1988, I personally became a victim of extortion. As a result of that incident, it then became either known or under suspicion that I might be gay. My home congregation, a United Church congregation, very quickly became not a safe place. Uh, not only for myself, but I was also married. I had a family. It was not safe for my spouse 
nor my children within that congregation. And we felt we were forced to leave. Also at the same time, I was chairing the board of a United Church camp. And because of the misconception that of course, all homosexuals are pedophiles. I was then asked to resign because I could no longer chair the camp board. Just sharing the experience, just to show some of the experiences that have taken place. And I am certainly not alone in many of those experiences. It probably is far more common than any of us even realize. According to Statistics Canada, close to 600 youth between the ages of 10 and 24 die by suicide every year. And numerous studies suggest that among lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth, approximately 32% contemplate or attempt suicide compared to 7% of all youth. And for trans youth, that rate is twice as high. But according to the Center of Addiction and Mental Health, it's not their sexuality that leads these kids down a suicidal path, but it's the stigma and the discrimination that face in a heterosexual world. Affirming ministries will seek to listen to the experiences of their members, including the painful experiences. The public statement is especially important. People whose gender identities and sexual orientations are marginalized and stigmatized also long for a spiritual home in which to celebrate to love God and to serve others. And they may have no way to know whether a particular ministry is one where they can be fully who they are and one or one where they will be shunned or rejected. I know personally uh, when I am visiting an area or traveling, that is one of the things that I will look for is an affirming ministry a congregation where we are able to worship uh, and feel that we are safe to worship there. Affirming ministries are seeking justice. They make an ongoing commitment to work for justice, to promote reconciliation and healing, and to create equity for people of all sexual orientations and gender identities within the church and within the wider society. They support and participate in events with the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. And they proudly display their affirming ministry banner and they encourage other ministries to become affirming and support the work of Affirm United. And I would just end on affirming ministries are not gay churches. And that certainly was one of the um, expressions that were made when my home church, Wilmot United, uh, was going through the process. There were people concerned that, well, we will just become the gay church. The affirming process isn't just about the gay issue works on a variety of justice issues. They know what the work of healing and justice making of being the church is an ongoing part of who they are, whether they strive to combat racism or work to make their buildings wheelchair accessible as they attend anti-poverty marches or seek to live out the United Church's apology on residential schools, or when they honor children and provide space for addiction support groups. 
work for justice on sexuality or gender issues often supports or integrates with other work for justice, anti-racism, economic justice, or environmental justice. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony. Thank you. The next question we're asking, where are you? What is your comfort zone? And uh, Ross, would you uh, lead us through a few minutes of that question? For sure. Um, you know, uh, so Two Rivers has uh, about five years ago became an affirming congregation and I was with Reverend Elizabeth when she took us through that process. And, you know, I asked the question, you know, for those who are on here, and it's great to see so, such representation from the two provinces, but from different churches too. You know, where are you now? Um, uh, why are you there? You know, it wouldn't just maybe ask where, why are you there? What is sparking you to, um, to want to go through this process or to question about this process? Um, you know, a, to ask the question to yourselves, but ask the question to the congregation. And, uh, you know, it's not something that's a destination. Uh, it, it took me a while after we became affirming. I thought, okay, they're good. We're, we're affirming now it's done. It's not done. It'll never be done. It's a journey you're on. And uh, it's a great journey. It's a fabulous journey. Um, and uh, so I just, you know, I asked the question, where are you? And that's what I hope you can come to us and, and say, here's where we are. Why are you there, right? And then what do you need from us? What do you need from us? How can we support you whether it's personally, whether it's your church, church, whether it's your pastoral charge, um, how can we support you um, going forward? Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Ross. So Kim, was that introduction? <laughs> Could you lead us through the steps to becoming a Fermi? And I should say a little more of introductions. So Kim uh, um, did her introductions when we went around the circle, but to repeat again, uh, this is a, a new uh, volunteer position that Kim holds within our United Church. And she's the coordinator for firm ministries in the Atlantic regions and parts of Quebec. And she serves in ministry in Nova Scotia and lives in Dartmouth. And uh, so we're happy to have her here uh, to offer her wisdom. Go ahead, Kim. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I'm I'm basing these 10 steps to becoming on the um, the webinar that you did last year. And so uh, you might hear some different things, but I'm going by those those steps. I didn't I didn't know there were 10 steps, but I'm going by your 10 steps today. Um, you'll see on the screen um, that's the Affirm logo. Don't use that unless you're affirming. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the first lesson. Uh, so I'm putting it up there today, but um, that is a logo that um, when you graduate from the Affirm program um, and you're presented your certificate, then you are allowed to use that logo on all of your stuff. And it's a very inviting logo. Before we begin, I just wanted to share quickly um, something that Tony sparked my memory of, uh, why, to, why doing this work? And, and this is a question, I grew up in a church that has not become affirming, but has always considered self welcoming, and just doesn't think that they need to go through the steps. But there's a beautiful video that I'll happily share with any of you from um, out west, and it's a minister speaking about why the region, their region should become affirming. And she tells a story about when she was in an affirming ministry, uh, but in the US, so it would have a kind of a different name to it, but the same idea. And one Sunday, they had a gentleman come in and sit at the back of the church and the, she introduced herself and others mentioned, you know, spoke to him and um, he cried through the whole service. And after the service was over, he left and they said goodbye and uh, didn't see him ever again. And a couple of months later, they got a, um, a note from him and it said that he had driven, I can't remember how many, I want to say almost a thousand miles to get to their church because he found it on the internet 
as an affirming church. And he said that before he died, he would like to go back to a church that affirms who he was because he had been rejected from the church that he grew up in as a child, but he still felt deeply connected to God. And what this minister says is that she knows for sure that there were many churches between where he lived and where her congregation was that would consider themselves welcoming, but it wasn't public, it wasn't intentional, and it wasn't explicit. So that's a um, little acronym that we like to use in a firm, P-I-E, public, intentional, and explicit. And part of being public is being able to say, uh, through the internet and Affirm United helps with that to make sure that you're Google, you're Googleable, <laughs> if that's a word, um, as an affirming church. And just like Tony says, they look up to see what church will affirm them um, and not just welcome them. I will say too that um, I know we're not French here today and I am certainly not French, but I will let you know um, quite often we say Affirming United and we think that that is it. Uh, so today you'll hear AUSE which is a firm united safame ensemble. And that's another way to be fully inclusive of everyone that is a part of this program. So, so 10 steps to becoming affirming. Oh. Creating an affirming committee. So that's your first step. So creating an affirming committee um, is gonna take the buzz, right? The buzz starts, maybe it starts in your, um, in your board, maybe it starts from a particular sermon and everybody's buzzing about it. It could be anything, um, but it starts with that. And where it goes from that is to, why aren't we affirming? That's usually what happens. Well, we're welcoming, but we're not affirming. Or in my case, uh, one of the churches I was in, they thought they were affirming because they were so welcoming. So they don't have the education to know the difference between the two things. And so um, starting to ask those questions, are we an affirming church? Where does the clergy play a role in that? Um, they are a, um, they're on the, usually on the board, but they are not a co-chair. They will not be a chair of the board because this has to be a congregational led um, experience. So an affirming committee will have representation from different groups within the church that are looking towards um, answering this question of will we become an affirming committee. So you start there. And so some of you are here from groups that um, from groups that are asking that question. I heard it in your introductions. We're thinking about it. We're thinking about it. So that's it. You, you've got an affirming committee. Forming an affirming committee does not mean that your church is going to become affirming. It's it's part of the process. So that's the very first step. So once you have an affirming committee, then you'll reach out to Affirm United. And I'm just gonna change my share here. I wanna show you a different spot. So AUSE, let me see if I can get this here, share screen. Can you see the internet on your screen? No. Okay, just a sec. Safari and, oh, I know why, bear with me. Just have to escape out of that one. There we go. There we go. Now you can, yes? Can you see the internet? Okay. So I'm just gonna make that. So the um, address that you had quoted last year was just for the English side. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that ause.ca is where you're going to go to get in contact with us. So you'll go and in this case, we'll select English. We'll select English. There we go. Um, and then at the bottom of the page is where often we have it at the top, but on our website, it's down here at the bottom and we have contact. So you'll click contact and then uh, affirming ministry coordinators comes up and that's where you fill out your information. And the reason we ask you to do this instead of going directly to, and if you guys, some of you know me, some of you might have my email address. Um, this happened when Liz was contacting me for, Elizabeth was contacting me for, for information. Um, I use a different email for this, uh, for this work, but we also uh, keep all three of our coordinators for the, the country in contact with one another. So when, it, when a process comes in, say I was on vacation, 
maybe Liz will get back to you right away, or sorry, Eli will get back to you right away, or maybe Linda will get back to you instead. And so um, I ask that you go through this and you just say, hey, we're interested. Can you be in touch with us and help us know where to go from here? So that's the first step. Fill this page out, send it in. We get it right away. If you don't hear from us, um, then please send us again. Uh, or if you know me, uh, reach out and say, hey, we sent something, we haven't heard anything, but uh, we're pretty good at getting back to you right away. All three of us are volunteers. Uh, two of us are in full-time ministry and uh, Linda is the coordinator for the country and for Central Canada. So she she keeps us on our toes. So if we miss something coming in, she'll send us a quick note, say, hey, did you see that come in from St. John or wherever? And so I find that very, very helpful. Um, before I leave this, I also will jump forward a little bit just to show you where to find some other stuff that you'll need as an affirm committee. So the first one is the affirming coordinators. And then the other great resources are under surprise, surprise resources. So you go to resources and then affirm affirming ministry resources, and you'll have all kinds of resources here. When you reach out to me, I'll also send back, um, uh, four individual pages that you'll need to uh, have a look at as, with your group and parts of them are here, but I'll send them all at once. So the, the biggest piece of our uh, resources is the open hearts document. So open hearts resource, there's an overview and there's a full PDF document. Anybody can look at it. Um, if you're nervous about you know, saying we're a firm committee and reaching out to me first, you can still look at this. So if your affirming committee is really interested and they're like, I'm not sure what to do, start here, have a look at this document. It's really, really valuable document. There's also an overview um, and that's what I'll be sending to you. And I have that in front of me on my, on my iPad here. So let's get back. So I stay in order of where I'm supposed to be today. And so go back here, to cheer. There we go. So making contact, you've got that. And the first part is about creating an inclusivity statement. So once you've reached out to me um, and I've reached back to you, I will have included four documents. As I say, part of that document will be um, this overview of the full PDF of, of open, um, open hearts. And there's a page in it that looks, I don't know if you can see it, doesn't matter, but it says uh, steps to becoming an affirming ministry. So it's a shorter version of a big long document. And to become an affirming ministry, it means that you're walking into an educational discernment and decision-making process as a group of people that are um, responsible to your board. So whatever your governing body is, you are responsible to your governing body. Quite often what happens is before this section, you form an affirming committee and then you show up at your next governing body <laughs> meeting and say, hey, we would like to have an affirming committee. And it kind of starts between the two. So, and it's really important that you guys are talking to each other and uh, we'll get to that in a minute too. But like I said, P-I-E, super important, public, intentional, and explicit. So you're asked to look at a variety of areas that may be barriers to those coming into your ministry and community, thinking about age, gender, race, ability, class, economic status, and in particular, gender identity and sexual orientation. So your inclusivity statement will be a broader statement. Quite often, you can look at the mission statement that your church already has and then say, who does that speak to? And I love what Tony said about uh, welcoming as an insider's thing that we say, you know, we're welcoming of others. And so when we become affirming, we have to start thinking about how, how are we including everyone, and this is very important too, in the full life and work of the community of faith. So we all know that there are communities of faith in other traditions, and sometimes even our own, unfortunately, that, and I hate this so much, love the sinner, hate the sin. Right. And so you're welcome. You're welcome to come here and and worship with us and put your money in the plate. But like Tony said, you can't be a Sunday school teacher and you're not allowed to be ordained and you certainly can't sit on the board. And so an inclusivity statement starts to name all of the people 
that are going to be included in this. So, um, and you might be like, well, what if we leave someone out? But chances are, if you really look at it and you talk uh, age, ability, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, race or culture or both, um, and think about your area, um, you're gonna include everybody under that umbrella. And it's gonna be inclusive to say who they are and then also what they're included in, which is the whole life and work of the congregation. So Affirm United expects that you will look at a variety of areas, as I've mentioned, and you start with thinking about what are the barriers. So like today, I noticed with your group when I was going through the stuff that you didn't include French. So just to let them know. Now, we don't speak French in my church, and so we don't say and languages. It's not included because we don't have that. Um, but as a region, you are a bilingual region, and so it would be important to state um, that we can we can work in French and English. It's a good thing. Um, that might be something in your in your own areas too, where there's so much uh, French and English in New Brunswick, is particularly. Um, the next step is create an equal marriage policy. So, an equal marriage policy. You may have a um, one that uh, uh, approaches sexuality that we've taken out. Um, that piece of it, but then we now we have a gender identity piece that's come in as well. And so uh, adding pronouns like they and them, um, being very aware of partner one and partner two or spouse one and spouse two or leaving it open to what the folks want to, to call it. So you are going to look at your existing marriage policy and see who's left out of that. You know, if your existing marriage policy says we believe that um, God ordains marriage between a man and a woman, well, you're leaving out a whole bunch of people in there. Uh, not only um, homosexual couples, but also couples that may be pansexual, that don't identify as, as heterosexual or homosexual, and, or as a man or a woman. You might be thinking about folks that identify as um, non-binary. So we wanna be able to include all people in an equal marriage policy. The fifth step, um, are some information for your team. So once you have your team together, these points are a little bit out of order, but I kept them the way that they were just because I did. I didn't want to mess anything up too much. Um, but for your new team, before you start um, looking at all of this information and um, bringing it to the governing body, um, the equal marriage policy and the inclusivity statement, because those are big things that people hold near and dear in churches, you know this. Well, we worked so hard on that mission statement. We spent an entire afternoon on our mission statement and now you're gonna just throw it out. Um, so that's gonna be a little bit of contention for some folks, not for everybody. Um, but your team has to really be the seat of education, the seat of discernment, um, the seat of the decision-making process so that people who come to people on your team um, can get their questions answered. So it's really good for you to, to educate yourselves first. So some of the things that you could do would be to invite someone from another affirming ministry to share their experience um, and what it was like becoming affirming. Um, we just recently went through an affirming process at Riverview United Church and are having our celebration on February the 18th. And uh, one of the things that our chairs looked out to because um, they just looked, okay, well, who's affirming in the area? And they went to uh, Bedford United Church. Great church, but Bedford United Church was made affirming a very long time ago. <laughs> so, the, so just the way the world worked was very different then. And so their experience was so different than what it might be for us. And, um, and even the person that they spoke to at that time, uh, who had been the minister at the time, wasn't familiar with gender identity. Um, and, and so that wasn't even part of the experience of them becoming affirming. It is now with the folks that are there. And like, um, I think it was Ross said, it's an ongoing process. You keep working towards making sure that you are including everyone. But I would look more closely at someone near to you that has done this uh, sooner than later, or that is currently in ministry at an affirming church. So after we had that experience, we went to a church that had just become affirming in a year before. And uh, that was much more helpful, much more helpful. That was more helpful uh, to us than it was um, hearing the other experience. 
I mean, that was educational for sure to see how far we've come, uh, but very different. Um, the other one, which we did at Riverview and I think is so helpful. One of the biggest questions and especially folks that, um, that just don't know. So if I say to you, invite someone to teach you the alphabet, you're like, well, I know the ABCs. But do you know what 2SLGBTQIA plus, what all of those mean? And so when people say, well, why do we use all that? What does that all mean? To have somebody come in and teach you about that or about the different pride flags that are used or about what the rainbow means, um, about pride in the history of the world or even in the history of the church. So thinking about people like that, that you could put on your resource list to come in, um, I am very lucky that I have uh, the top drag queen in all of Nova Scotia, I would say the Maritimes as my very best friend. And so he came in and, and helped us with that. You wanna have somebody that comes in that, um, like one of the things he said to our group right away is you can't offend me, right? So ask your stupid questions here. This is the safe place to ask the stupid questions, right? I don't, you know, so often if we don't know things where we don't want to embarrass someone or we don't embarrass ourselves by saying the wrong thing. And so this part of the work was so important, especially for our group, um, because so many of our people, we thought we, they thought they were already affirming. And so they had all these ideas in their head about how they were already welcoming. And they thought they knew everything about gender identity and homosexuality and, and all of the, the, uh, the spectrum of sexuality and come to find out, you know, very little. And so it's really nice to realize what you don't know. And so if you're thinking that the only thing you need to know is whether someone's married to a man or a woman, you're wrong. <laughs> There's so much more to it. And it's such a beautiful community to connect to. Um, depending on who you're working with, um, you can save yourself a lot of tongue twisting by saying the queer community. Um, that's very acceptable here in Nova Scotia and in other parts of the country. I'm not sure what it is in New Brunswick and PEI, um, but I would ask the people who are part of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community in your area if queer community is something that they use. And that's, um, I know growing up to call someone queer, that used to be like a really bad word. Like you don't, you don't say that, um, but they have reclaimed that word and um, and quite proudly. And so, uh, for example, I'm the mom of two queer kids and, uh, and I think that's wonderful. Like it's not a, it's not derogatory anymore. So that's something to consider as well. The next step is developing an education plan. So sitting with your firm group, once you have educated yourselves and started thinking about the things that you're going to need to look at the marriage policy and the, um, the inclusivity statement, really thinking about, okay, well, how are we going to educate ourselves, but also our communities of faith on, on the things that they might have questions about? So developing an education plan, sitting down and mapping it out. The affirming process um, takes about a year. Um, it, it can go a little quicker, but it usually takes a full year and it can take a lot longer depending on, on how fast you move. And so um, thinking, you know, sitting and saying, when do we want to have this done? You know, and really laying out your plan. This is one of the most important parts as your team to lay out your plan and to say, this is what we're going to do. And everybody's going to be different. So there's not a, this is the educational plan that you use to become an affirming church. Because all of the congregations are different. You know, some have the ability to show movies or to uh, have speakers in. They, you know, they have a connection with somebody in the area. Um, but everybody's going to be different and there's no wrong way to do this as long as you're doing it. So sitting down, having an education plan, working through the process um, and knowing like having a map of where you're going. If you don't have a map, you're not gonna get where you think you know you're going. Um, so how to keep your folks in the know. Um, some congregations, especially if there's resistance in your congregation to this idea, it'll be very important to hold a congregational meeting that usually starts with the governing body. So you would start with your governing body um, and speak to them and they would be the ones that would inform the congregation about this affirming process happening. And explaining that you're going through an affirming process doesn't mean that it's an automatic yes. It's really important at that time that you explain to the congregation that there'll be a vote at the end of things. They will have their voices heard 
they are encouraged to come to the educational pieces um, and all just to make sure that they know it's not just this group of five or 12 people, three people that are going to make this decision for the whole church. Uh, because it is a big deal for a lot of folks. And it's a big deal within your church and it's a big deal within your community. So it's really important that everybody is on board with this. So starting with your governing body and then letting your governing body um, address your church and then through educational um, opportunities, like uh, there's some wonderful movies through um, the Canadian, oh, it's not coming to me, CNB. National Film Board, NFB, National Film Board that you can show uh, in, in your churches. Um, great, great little things and then have discussions after it or, you know, have including it if your minister is on board, asking your minister to include, um, you know, maybe a, a sermon series on, on different parts of the rainbow, for example, or, or things like that. So um, it's very, it, this public part has to start even before you make that inclusivity statement. Everybody has to be in the know, and that's going to make it easier in the end. Finally, after you have completed your um, equal marriage policy and your uh, inclusivity statement, you're going to send those to me. And I will be, uh, I'll, we bounce them back and forth a few times. Sometimes there'll be suggestions. Sometimes it's missing something entirely. And we have to say, you really need to have, and one of the things, and that's why I was so explicit about it at the beginning. One of the things that's often missing is in the full life and work of the community of faith, right? So we welcome everybody here, um, isn't enough. It needs to really say, what are they welcome to be a part of? You know, what is everybody, you know, we affirm these people as people of God. And so as people of God, you can be a part of us, you know, every, every single part. So there's that line of, and you will find that in the open hearts document. Uh, there's way more information than of course I'm giving here uh, in the step-by-step -step of thinking about what you need to look for. But one of the pieces that is often missing is, is that piece about um, um, in the full life and work or some wording thereof. So after those two things have been approved, um, and I would bring them to um, bring them to me before you bring them to your governing board, um, because if you bring them to the governing board, they say, "Oh yeah, that's great," and they bring it to me, it's missing something. You got to go back to the governing board, and they get, you know you can keep them informed of this is what we're sending. Uh, we don't need your we don't need a vote yet. We don't need approval on it yet. We don't need anything like that. Just letting letting them know. And we always had an affirm rep uh, every month at our at our um, governing board meetings so that they could fill us in on what was going on, what, what kind of educational things they had coming up or had had and how they were successful or not successful. And, um, and then going forward from there. So once those two things are approved, equal marriage policy and the inclusivity statement, then it's time to create an action plan. And this ties into where, what Ross was saying, it's ongoing. You don't just get your stamp and you're done. It's very much like a marriage. If you want it to work, you gotta keep on working at it. And so it's really good for us to think ahead. What in the, in the oncoming year, years ahead, how are we going to continue to affirm um, the people that we've said we've affirmed as, as children of God? And so it might be, you know, like we're going to celebrate Pi Day every year. Um, uh, we're going to make sure we're a part of our local parade or we're going to have this or we're going to invite our um you know, our, our local uh, gay straight alliance to use our church, you know, there's all kinds of cool and innovative ways to think about how can we really say, we're your church, we are your people. And so that is the last step that you'll pass into me. And then between myself and Linda, looking at the action plan might have some suggestions and those sorts of things. Then you're going to take those three documents and you're going to present them to your, your governing body. And the governing body needs to approve them before they go to the congregation. Um, and, and that's just because it's a big, it's, it's a change to a mission statement of a church. It's a change to policy. These things need to go through. Um, I don't know if it's a polity issue, but it's just, it's just good practice, just good ethics to do it this way. So here we are. Now we have the community of faith approval. So after it's gone through the governing body and the governing body has said, um, yes, let's bring this to the church. Then a congregational meeting is, is called and letting people know what you'll be voting on. And they vote on the equal marriage policy. They vote on 
the um, inclusivity statement or new mission statement, um, they do not need to vote on the action plan because that's part of the ongoing work of the affirm committee. And then they will vote on whether or not they would like to become a um, community of faith that calls themselves an affirming ministry. So that's the final, the final piece and that vote um, will happen and you need to have um, quite a high percentage to pass that vote. Um, I wanna say it's 80%, but I don't have that number right in front of me. And then the last part is my favorite part. It's time to celebrate. So this is part of the public um, piece. Some people like to put this in the Sunday morning worship. I would suggest that when it is time to celebrate that you've become an affirming church, that you have it at a time that's outside of Sunday morning worship. Um, so folks feel more comfortable coming maybe for the first time and checking you guys out and um, invite people from the congregation. We have, well, my drag queen friend is gonna be singing at ours and, and we have uh, uh, one of the members of our church is leading and um, we have invited all kinds of members of the community. We've actually sent uh, sponsor requests to um, members in our community to say, hey, we'll put your name on our stuff if you'll give us some money to help put on our put on our celebration. And so um, our, our stuff is paid for because you know in the church people are like where's the money coming from right so the community will get on board if uh if you look out and think think to yourself know what what businesses around us would consider themselves affirming you know or would like to see themselves as affirming and so uh we asked the banks we asked the insurers we asked the bakery we asked everybody to be a part of our of our celebration and they're they're getting credit for being a part of that too so it works both ways you can become very involved with the community so that's a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna turn this off. Is there anything, first of all, that I missed? I know we were gonna stop and do questions all along, but I got on a roll. So did you make any notes or anything? Do you have questions for me before we uh, move into breakout rooms? I have a question, Kim. Sure, Lynn. Um, my congregations are really small and everybody's already maxed out on committees. How do I make another committee? <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. And we have that same, we have that same thing. Um, you have to inspire it first, right? So why, why, why would we do that? Right? So one of the other things that I know from a research project that I did for AST was when I was looking at um, what it's like to be spiritual but not religious in the United Church of Canada. One of the interesting side pieces that came out of my research was that the folks that identify themselves, themselves as spiritual but not religious, um, I think it was 85% of those people are, were already part of an affirming church or had sought out an affirming church. So they weren't, they weren't gay or they, they weren't uh, transgender, they weren't any other thing other than they said, well, if they've done that work, maybe I'll be included there too. So there's people that will end up coming to your church. You know, you might lose some people too. And we can discuss that. Um, so it's, 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 does it matter? You know, that's what it is. It's bringing it forth to the congregation saying, does it matter? You know, one of the things that our church, uh, once we did an affirming process, we've had a number of, of folks in the community that identified as gay and lesbian, um, no transgender folks yet, but uh, we are in a, quite a rural area. And so, uh, but we do have gay, gay and lesbian um, couples and community and uh, they've started coming uh, because they're really excited to, to know that they belong. They belong in a space like that. And so um, it's added to the life and work of our church. So there was more people to be on committees. <laughs> so Kim. Yeah. Just to give us some time for breakout rooms. I'm look, just look at the clock here. <laughs> There's lots of conversation. So I'm going to put us into breakout rooms yeah. now. And it's only going to be for five minutes. Okay. And uh, you'll be, I think, three to four in a group. And you have a conversation there. And then bring back your questions to the larger group. And we'll have five minutes at the end to, uh, uh, to debrief that. How does that sound? Sounds great to me. All right. So hopefully this works. You'll be off to breakout rooms. And if you, uh, uh, anyway, we'll just, it'll work. Off you go. <laughs> Liz, are the board members and myself joining a room?
Yes. So you want me to be in a room? You you will have gone. Yes, please. Yes. I think I think it's probably best if I just stay here. Oh, okay, sure. Whatever you like. Okay. People might have stuff they want to talk about without me there. Sure. Okay. So I'm, yes. I'm not in a room either. Yeah. Okay. So you and I'll stay here. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think that went? I uh, see. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm just so I'm just kind of paying attention to the screen here and. Yeah. Okay. Breakout rooms. You and I. Yeah. Like yeah it. Uh, I think it went really well. Okay. Totally good. A lot longer than anticipated. Yes, he did. <laughs> It was supposed to be five minutes. It yeah. was fifteen. I know. I know. I so that's why I didn't. I didn't stop for questions right. along Thank the way, you. and I also um, yeah. just yeah. kept going because I had everything that you guys wanted included last year. You had all the stuff written out um, right. for each slide, and I was like, I, I'm not going to be able to do that in that amount of time. So right. let's give yeah. them the the nitty gritty um, right. and get them going. And so I I hope that I shared some of the stuff that's important. Oh, I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah. the slides, the slides will be up as a reminder to folks that they yeah. want to go back in and watch it or in the resources, you right. know, whatever's provided there. Yeah. And if so, you, you still see the screen, right? Yes. So yeah, this so, is the next, so debrief and then what next, who to contact. And we've talked yes, about that. Yes. Um, yeah. And then everybody's names that are on the committee there. Sure. And this is the main one. And so I didn't, I didn't include anything else other than this. And I've showed them how to go and do the contact. So all those folks that are thinking about it should already yeah. be in touch with me. Cause I'm yeah. not going to say like, what have you done? It's, it's, no. a, it's a congregational led piece, yeah. but then we get, we get them on a radar and we can check in and say, is there anything you need? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm just, just, sorry, I'm just watching the time for a minute. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Oh shoot. I should, I have to end the recording, but just bear with me. Stop I, I think it's just recording us, not everybody else, but yeah, good idea. Stop the recording. Stop the recording.